So today's talk is titled Use Rust for Games. Let me get it up on the screen. There we go. Um, we're not going to go super in depth or technical into this. It's going to be kind of high level because that's, you know, all the room that's there. I, I want to show you all how essentially I started building some games for Rust and why I think Rust is a great language for making video games. Uh, I think most of you are probably like me. Uh, there's unlike, if there's someone in the audience that works for a AAA studio, uh, well, my handle's there in the lower left corner, but also I, I don't expect that this talk is necessarily for you, although I think Rust is going to make its way to AAA games eventually. Um, but who I'm really aiming at is like many developers, I tinker in video games, I like video games, and it's part of the reason I got into development. So, you know, who am I? Um, so let's mention, my name is Eric Smith. I'm Peyton Rules anywhere on the internet. If you find a Peyton Rules on the internet, it's probably me. Uh, if there's somebody on the internet with the handle of Peyton Rules saying really, really horrible things, let me know, because I'm gonna get blamed for it. Um, but for the most part, uh, I'm Peyton Rules anywhere, but in real life, my name is Eric Smith, and I am, here at home with my wife. We got five kids. My annoying dog that I love very much is sitting next to me. And I started streaming on Twitch a year and a half ago because it was the pandemic, like everyone else, you had to start doing something like that. And so I started streaming on Twitch because I had wanted to learn Rust for a really long time. Back in the day, I was an old C and C++ programmer. And I wanted to give this a try. I fiddled with a little Hello World. I worked my way through, you know, the, the beginner Rust book, the book from the docs. And I started making games because it's kind of one of my two hobbies. Uh, I like to run obstacle races and I like to make little games. So if there is a language, there's a good chance I've made a half complete version of Space Invaders in it. Um, so I started out using a game framework called Godot. The people who develop Godot call it, pronounce it Godot. If you were to go watch the play in England, they call it, they pronounce it Gato, which is the play waiting for Gato. Uh, this is probably how it's supposed to be pronounced, but the community pronounces this, this game engine Godot, so I'm going to pronounce it Godot. Godot is a great game engine. It is not at the tier of Unreal or Unity 3D, but it's maybe a level below. Uh, unlike those other two, it's completely free as in beer. Uh, it's got, it's open source, it's developed in public, and it costs nothing to use. So I was doing some streaming on this. I built a little blackjack game. I built a little iPhone app. And I took one tutorial on Godot, and I wrote how you might or how to port it to Rust, because Godot's native scripting language isn't Rust, it's GDScript. And it has a great setup, though, for binding to any language like C, C++, or Rust, anything that can run natively. So I wrote this tutorial. It's still available on PeytonRules.com. Like I said, if it's Peyton Rules, it's probably me. And I was approached by Packet Publishing, hey, do you want to write a book? And after a lot of back and forth, and my wife, uh, encouraging me that, yes, you do too want to write a book. Um, I, we went back and forth on a proposal and I said, you know, maybe Godot isn't the best thing to write a book about. Maybe we should use WebAssembly. And the reason I said we should use WebAssembly was twofold. I still wanted to stay in Rust. That was one. And Rust will compile natively to WebAssembly. And the other was Godot changes a lot. So I didn't want to write a book that was going to be not worth the paper it was printed on by the time it got published. Um, so you might wonder, might not, what is WebAssembly? WebAssembly is a binary format for running applications on the web. It is not like Java applets or ActiveX controls because it is native to every browser and even can run in Node. And you just include this binary format in your normal JavaScript program and ta-da, it runs. Okay, so it is a standard, but the compiling to it is a little experimental. So I proposed this. They liked the idea. 
we signed a contract and I said, oh crap, because I don't actually know anything about WebAssembly other than like two blog posts. Is this a good idea? Did I choose, right the, choose the right technology? Is writing a game in Rust a good idea at all? Or am you know, I doomed? I mean, and the answer is yes. Otherwise this talk wouldn't exist. We wouldn't be here. There's no reason for all of us to do this. Spoiler, I think Rust is great for games. I think that as I, as I and anyone else, of course, gets better at it, it'll become even better for games. It's ideally suited for it. And frankly, I think it's a shame that right now its usages tend to be in more niche things or in the blockchain. Um, and so why, why Rust? Why do I think Rust is great for games when C and C++ are the dominant markets for video game development? Why should you write your next game? Uh, why should you write your next game in Rust? And actually I did see the chat question. So Le uh, Leon, when I say native, I meant compiling directly to iOS. Um, to, to, uh, so um, let me be clear. what I mean is it compiled directly to like machine code, right? So it runs, it doesn't run in a web browser. It's running, it was running natively. That's how Godot programs work. That's a good question, thank you. Uh, so why, why choose Rust when C and C++ are both already out there and are the predominant languages for game development, right? Like it's C and C++, and then there's some, there's some C sharp there because of the popularity of Unity, but even the internals of Unity are written in C and C++ because games run at 60 frames a second. They cannot tolerate a garbage collector coming in and causing everything to stall. Um, why should you switch if you're using them right now? Why should you use Rust if you're using JavaScript right now? Right? You can make games in JavaScript on the web. People do it all the time. Yes, there is a garbage collector. Yes, there's potential issues for performance, but you can do it and it's been done. I've done it. Why should you switch to Rust? So I, I have a few reasons I think Rust is a great language to try. And one is you're gonna learn stuff. So if you're coming, from C and C++, and I don't expect many of you are, uh, I did once upon a time. You have to use what's called manually managed memory. That means you are responsible for deleting the memory. So if you know you spent, there are you know, many, many, many programmers who spent their entire career in garbage collected languages, like you know, Java, C Sharp, almost anything else, where they don't really think about how memory works. And they just create stuff and eventually a garbage collector comes in and it gets rid of it. And until you're like deep in some weird performance hole, you don't think about it. On the other hand, C and C++ programmers have to think about it constantly and all the time. And they learn to structure their programs in such a way that they don't have issues with memory management. And they use things like, uh, uh, what is it? RAII, which is resource acquisition is initialization and smart pointers. And a lot of that stuff is just built into Rust. But also you'll learn stuff like if you're a C and C++ programmer, Rust has a lot of functional constructs. It has built-in immutability. It has a lot of things that are not native to C and C++. Rust is an imperative language, but it has a lot of functional traits to it and it has some OOO traits to it. Um, and it's different. And I like that about it. I like that it's done a little bit of a cafeteria style to its development. I want a little of this, a little of that, a little of that. And it's a little bit of a Frankenstein, but it's, it's a good Frankenstein. <laughs> right, so you will learn stuff. And if you're you know, making games as a hobby like I do, learning is numero uno. Um, Rust has really, really nice tooling. Okay, I like, if I may digress a little bit, um, a few years ago, I was really enjoying Go because Go also has some really, really nice tooling. And when, when I say really nice tooling, um, well, let me explain with the counter example. So Go has a really good tool called Go Imports, which gives you IDE-like support for you use some type and it will automatically import to it. And it has easy going to files. Um, what it doesn't have is a good package management system. It has a little bit of one now with Go modules, um, but in general, it's bolted on well after the fact because that tool wasn't a priority 
for the Golang developers. They didn't feel it was necessary. Their strategy was essentially just adjust your Go path or create a Docker container. Um, a lot of other languages also have great tools like you know, IntelliJ for Java, the tool from Microsoft for C Sharp that shall not be named. Right? There's a lot of great tools, but these are all done afterwards. If you're coming from C and C++, you probably never used a package manager except app get. So Rust was built, I think, from very early on with developer experience in mind. They looked at it and went, well, Rust is going to come out. It's a compiled, statically typed language. These typically need an IEE, but developers aren't going to have that. So they released, because you can't build the IDE before you build the language. And unlike a lot of languages that think of the languages, the syntax, Rust thought of it as the entire ecosystem. So when you get Rust, you get Rust up, which lets you manage versions of Rust right out of the box. You get Cargo for building, for building your projects and managing packages. You've got uh, built-in unit tests are already part of the language. You've got a linter that's already there. And then the only tool that I would call that's added after, which is essentially part of the, and I'm kind of talking about stuff in my mouth, is Rust Analyzer. Rust Analyzer gives you IDE-like functionality in non-IDE. So this is just an example I pulled out of my stuff today, where I just deleted the E from Walk the Dog. And you can see I'm getting now the yellow squiggly saying Walk the Dog isn't used anywhere. I've got an error here, the red squiggly, saying it fails to compile, and I've got the error message over the top. And what's worth noting is this is all in Emacs. I'm not using some fancy IDE, but I'm getting IDE-like functionality. And it, it just keeps going beyond that, right? Like car, if anyone here, well, I know many of you here have used Bundler before. Uh, what the Rust developers did when they were building it out is they went, well, we need package management. We need it early. We don't want to be like some of these other languages. What if we just call the guy who wrote Bundler and, get, Bundler and give him money and he can write our package manager? And so what Cargo comes with is Bundler, if Bundler was able to not make any of the early mistakes of Bundler because it had already learned from writing it once. Which makes it a really nice package management system. So I put that early intentionally as to why I like Rust because I think a language is way more than just the syntax that it has. Uh, you know, Haskell has a in many ways, beautiful syntax, but it's you know pretty hard to use. Um, and that's why I wanted to point this out, right? Like the tooling is excellent, even though I do in fact like the syntax, right? Like the syntax is pretty cool for the most part. It's not the most aesthetically pleasing language. I'm not gonna tell you it's as pretty as Clojure, um, but it does have some stuff going for it. It is statically typed. For the most part, I prefer statically typed languages nowadays. Um, I know that I've gotten a lot done in Ruby and Python and JavaScript in my life. And that also you can get a lot of benefits simply by writing tests. But I'm stealing a line from Callan Jones, who stole this line from someone else when he told it to me. Why would I throw away free tests? And a compiler is like the free tests. That's what static types are. Right? It's statically typed. It's not strictly object oriented in the sense that unlike Java or C Sharp or some of those others, you don't have to create a class for everything. You can have standalone functions. I typically do. It supports abstract data types. Uh, so abstract data types, if you've ever used an enum, those typically map to numbers, right? Well, abstract data types let you bundle stuff in with them. And we'll see an example of that that I'll pull out of the game that was, was built for the book. Um, but abstract data types are great for writing expressive code. And it, it also doesn't support nil and has a built-in result type. So I actually want to walk you through this little bit here. Um, the function browser draw UI, uh, which is on the third line, because I actually don't know how I would highlight that. Um, it returns what's called the result type. A result type can be one of two things. It can be an error or it can be the, the thing itself. It can be whatever you expected back. Uh, in Go, this is done by returning two values. In some languages, this is done by just throwing an exception. And some languages also have a result type. The result type then has methods on it. So there's a method here. And then 
which just says, okay, if there was a good result, take the value and pass it to this close, this function, which is actually a closure, right? So if you were able to draw the UI, we actually ignore the value here. That's why it's underscored. Call this next one, but don't call it if it failed. And that's how you're able to chain things together. And then when you get that result, map it to calling the engine and click handler. Now this actual little function call has a bit of a wart on it because I call unwrap at the end. Um, I would have bet you a dollar that I went through the code and deleted every unwrap. Uh, apparently I've got at least one. Uh, what unwrap does is it takes a result or an option type and, set, and behaves in many ways like uh, the behavior you might be used to in a language like JavaScript and says, well, if it's an error, throw it all the way up the stack. Um, Unwrap tends to show up in Rust code at the early stages when you're trying to figure stuff out and then you get rid of it and properly handle the error. Um, why do I like that? Um, it can be hard to understand the value if you're unfamiliar with types like that, but it forces you to explicitly deal with stuff and more importantly, makes it impossible for accidents to just sort of show up because you didn't know a result, an error came from something. It's kind of fulfilling the process that checked exceptions were supposed to fulfill in Java but without being nearly as ugly. Uh, the other tool I wanted to highlight, other thing I wanted to highlight about this language is that Rust is immutable by default. So state here cannot change because I did not specify that it's mute. The same goes for receiver. If you come from a functional language, you know, if you are a fan of closure um, or if you're fan of uh, Sharp, Haskell, some of the other ones that do this. Immutable by default can really be a game changer. It's uh, an adjustment if you come from an object-oriented language where we change everything, right? We bundle our, our data and our state together. And when you call the methods, the state changes. Immutable language, or immu immutable objects or things can't change. And what that me means is when you go through your code, you can tell what's not gonna change. It, it takes much like maybe the result type. It takes a little getting used to, but it ends up being great. Unlike say JavaScript where you could just change anything anywhere, get completely lost. So there's one other thing I wanna address with this little code snippet. And I'm not expecting you all to understand the whole thing here. Um, it's just a part that had some constructs I liked uh, was that the thing that comes up with anybody looking to learn Rust is the borrow checker. If you're unaware, the borrow checker is how Rust manages memory without requiring you to constantly manage memory. You only have to think about it sometimes. You don't never have to think about it. You have to think about it sometimes, which I kind of feel is a really good line to walk if you're trying to learn a little more about that. So what is the borrow checker? Well, when someone calls this function and gives it a state, this function now takes ownership of the state. Any object is defined by its scope. It will be deleted at the end of scope. So because this method or this function or method uh, owns state, it will be destroyed at the end of state, this function. Now, what that means is whoever called it has to be prepared for that. They cannot use state afterwards. This can lead to some degree of butting your head against the borrow checker, especially initially. However, you, <laughs> I'd say it's a little, it does feel a little like Stockholm syndrome. Like first you hate it, then you start to respect it and eventually you love it. What it forces you to do is recognize when you're cloning stuff. Another one of my favorite languages, and it's still a favorite language is F sharp. F sharp just copies stuff like crazy. And so your memory can just go, right? Rust doesn't allow you to do that, but it also doesn't allow you to do things like pass something into a function and have that function delete it and you don't know, which is a very common error uh, in C and C++ programs. So my advice to anybody who starts learning some Rust and starts fighting with the borrow checker um, is one of two things. If you're banging against the borrow checker a lot and it's, you know, Porter's here, he knows, I've banged against the borrow checker many, many times on stream and it is, as programmers, we're stubborn, right? Like, got to figure out exactly what I'm supposed to do. Um, there's two things going on. One is either your design is kind of wrong and you need to figure out how to design it in a more 
rust friendly way and a more memory friendly way. And the other is, and they're not mutually exclusive is maybe just clone the object and move on, make the copy. This is something people don't want to do in their coding because like it feels wasteful, but it's far less wasteful than most of your code, which is just making the copies under the hood without telling you. Make the copy move on. And if you find out that part of the code is slow or taking up memory, then go ahead and go back and try to fix it. Rust is also really fast. It's going to have a smaller memory footprint than a Java program, a JavaScript program, and a C Sharp program. It doesn't have a garbage collector. If you're making games that run at 60 frames a second, you can't, you really don't want, I shouldn't say can't because people have made games in garbage collected languages. You don't want a garbage collector to come in and make everything stall, right? Huh. Rust has a community that for the most part, I find to be excellent. I know there was some drama in the community in the last couple of weeks. Uh, I hope it resolves itself. I'm not gonna go into it details now, um, but in general, they're an incredibly helpful community. So just got, grabbed a couple items in the screenshots, you know, Rustations like the crab, right? That's right. Rustation is what Rust programmers call themselves. Rustation, right? is crab, a crustacean. So this is the Rust Bridge workshop on the left, and it's dedicated to getting underrepresented people into the community. And it's the kind of thing you can find a lot of in the Rust community. There's always a need for more. Um, and on the right is just a few of the discords I'm in when it comes to Rust. And I just wanna tell briefly a little story about uh, rs.fm that you see over there on the right. So that is the Rustation station Discord for the podcast Rustation Station, which you know frequently listen to while running. Well, the person who runs that is named, and I'm gonna butcher the pronunciation, Jan Youngsten, who he organizes the podcast, which is edited by the community. People do he just asks, can somebody edit this? And someone else does it. Um, he also has done a ton of videos called The Crust of Rust, which are really great for like if you want to learn deep in the internals. Um, and he provides this discord for any streamer and will give you a channel on your discord and set it on his discord and set it up with notifications and all you got to do is ask and i tell that story because i feel like that's been a much better reflection of what i've seen in the rust community because now i've got a channel in that discord I, nobody knows me from adam right um but you know somebody who's got one of the books that's behind me was help was immediately willing to help me out and get help me get my name out there. So I did these games in, in Godot, right? That's the, the left is the, Gundo, the Godot framework icon, which is super adorable. Um, and on the right is, I say games, I made two games and I made an app. The app is a little crazy. It, it is a game developed app that runs on the iPhone, written in Rust, and it uses GitLab as its backing store. I commit and I basically take to-do notes from by staving them to my GitLab repository. Um, it is not the most efficient way to build an iOS app. You should probably just use Swift or Flutter, but it was a lot of fun. Um, and it made a pretty good blackjack game. You know, I could go back in there and say, you know, add splits, double down, start getting money. And I could probably distribute a pretty decent blackjack game. I could probably even put it on phones, but I'm not convinced that the desktop or the phone is the best deployment target if you're at home. <laughs> if you're a solo or a two-man band, kind of want to work in the browser, right? If you work in the browser, you can deploy it anywhere. You can update in seconds. You can add a backend server whenever you want. You don't have to worry about taking payment or any of that stuff. Okay, good. Just did a quick double check to make sure you're all still there. It's been very quiet. Um, the browser is where probably most of us work most of the time. There's no fighting with Steam. So if you want to make games for the browsers, you got a lot of options, right? You can use JavaScript. That's probably the most common. You could use TypeScript. I'm sure a lot of you are looking at the, the stuff I raved about with Rust and said, I like it in TypeScript. Why do I need to switch? Uh, why should I use this WebAssembly thing? And I'll, 
uh, explain again what WebAssembly is, because I think I did it pretty quick last time, but WebAssembly is a binary format with also a text representation, but it's a binary format that allows you to load essentially a program into your JavaScript program. So it can be run from the browser. It just needs to be loaded by JavaScript itself. And there is a standard communication format because it lives in sort of a different aspect of the runtime. And the key thing about WebAssembly that you'll need to understand is that it is a managed memory setup. You can't have a garbage collector in WebAssembly. Now, if you know, if you know some tools that target WebAssembly, you might say, hey, wait, Blazor targets WebAssembly. There is TypeScript has a compiler called AssemblyScript. Those are garbage collected languages and they target WebAssembly. And I haven't done the research on Blazor, but I know what TypeScript does. It embeds a garbage collector of its own. Uh, there is a WebAssembly spec that is not finished yet about what they want a garbage collected version of WebAssembly to look like. And I say, forget it. Let's just use a language that is managed memory and go ahead and target WebAssembly. Um, and one of the reasons you might want to do WebAssembly over TypeScript and JavaScript is that it's fast, right? So this is just a quote from the, uh, this is the Mozilla folks when they were writing so source maps, called it oxidizing source maps because they converted them to Rust. But they were able to remove all of the performance hacks they put in the JavaScript application and just write Rust. They didn't have to choose, as he puts it, between clearly expressing intent and runtime performance. Um, Rust, or it's not Rust, sorry, WebAssembly supported everywhere. You know, if you do can I use on WebAssembly, you're going to get pretty much everywhere in the browser. And this is all it takes. Import a WASM file. And here we've got WASM. That's the name of the module. Start. This is taken straight out of the code that I had for my game. And this is generated. Right. The entire purpose of WebAssembly is to let you use languages you like on the web. I like Rust better than JavaScript. I like Rust better than TypeScript. I think TypeScript is better than JavaScript, but I don't want a garbage collector. TypeScript doesn't have abstract data types. Um, it still allows the any type, which is essentially just a loophole that lets you, you know, write anything you want. So, you know, why not choose what was done first and use C++ to write for WebAssembly? Well, I, I think the screen shows why you might not want to write C++ for WebAssembly. Um, the tooling on the Rust side for doing WebAssembly is significantly better, I would argue, than C. Um, using mscript in with something like an OpenGL app is pretty good, or an SDL app like here, but trying to do something like uh, manipulate the DOM is just, it's puked. <laughs> it's bad. And in C++, like, I already told you all the reasons I want to write Rust instead of C++. Already got those reasons. So I think Rust is the best language for WebAssembly. You want to compile the WebAssembly, you have to write one Rust up command and you're ready to go. And so maybe I should prove it, right? Let's take a little look at some of the code that was written to make a game in WebAssembly. So I'm going to start real quick with my tech stack. Whoa. Ah, can you... Uh, uh, Prabhu, can you hold that thought and remind me at the end? Because uh, that is a very good question. Um, so the tech stack right now is Webpack, uh, Wasmpack, my game, WebSys, and BindGen. So starting at the bottom, Wasm BindGen is a library that lets you uh, bind Rust code to JavaScript. That is anywhere, Node, browser, whatever the environment is. Um, so uh, what does that mean? Well, you can't directly say in WebAssembly call console.log. You have to like extern a pointer and puts convert stuff into one form of memory and then shoot it out the other side so that the browser can actually execute it. Fortunately, you don't actually have to write all that nonsense. Wasm bind gen takes care of that for you. On top of that sits WebSys. These are not tools I wrote. These are community tools. Uh, WebSys, which is basically take the browser 
and already bind everything you need. So Wasm bind gen is the tools to bind to the browser. WebSys is like, here's all the things a browser should have, the entire JavaScript specification. My game sits on top of those. Notice you don't see an engine in here. Um, somebody asked about before I started if I was going to touch on Bevy. I'm not using Bevy. It's all homegrown stuff. Um, that's nothing against Bevy. That might be something I do next year, but Bevy isn't. Bevy is on the web, but not well documented and stuff yet. It's getting there. At least last time I looked. Um, Wasm Pack is a Rust WebAssembly tool, and all of these three uh, tools are maintained by the Wasm Rust Wasm user uh, Rust Wasm user group, not user group uh, foundation compatibility group. The name will come to me in like five minutes. Um, but Wasm Pack just takes the compiled code and bundles it up so it's ready to be in a node module. I could do npm install, walk the log if I really wanted to. And then finally, Webpack sits there on top because Webpack is a virus that has infected all of our JavaScript programs and all of the web browser and everywhere. Uh, it can never be gotten rid of. Uh, Webpack is how you take all that stuff and convert and just combine it together so it's an actual single page app. Fortunately, I don't do much with working group. That was the phrase I was looking for. Thanks, Brian. Um, fortunately, I don't deal too much with Webpack and Watson Pack. I start up Webpack and forget about it. Watson Pack, I literally had to Google what it did because I installed it once and forgot about it for six months, uh, which is double disappointing in myself because I think I also wrote a definition of what it does. So CICD, and I, I bring this up because when you talk about doing different technologies, frequently deployment's an issue. Deployment was not an issue. This is a snippet from the GitHub Actions I use right now. They run tests, they run Clippy, and they push to Netlify. And so I right now can do a PR build, which will use Netlify to create a test deployment so that I can see it and write it as like a line item in the bottom of the GitHub action. And if I push that into main, that will end up being the production build and released. Um, and <laughs> to tell you how easy this was, the, the chapter on it's like 20 pages. Uh, but you guys don't wanna see that. You probably wanna see that, which is the game itself. And let me take you on over. Not that one, not that one, that one. There we go. Let's turn off the music because I don't know if you guys can hear that or not, but it's loud in my head. So this is the game. It's playing music in the background. And here he is. All of you could go to that website right now and there would be no real load because there's no server. This is all single page app stuff. As you can see, the collision detection is perfect and there are no problems with it whatsoever because Rust doesn't allow you to have any bugs. See, no bugs, not a one. Um, but that's the game. And it will get, of course, tweet. I mean, if someone watches this video on YouTube in a week, it's going to be tweaked by then. <laughs> Check your speaker volume first, too. Yeah, Porter's got a point. Amongst the list of line item bugs I've got is uh, the music's a little loud. Uh, there, I did all the development on Firefox. So if you do check it out, um, there's a, a uh, there's a couple little gotchas in Chrome. You'll see a little highlight around the box. You might have to click into the canvas to make it start playing. And it's just a space bar and you push to the right to get them started. Our little red hat boy. And this is all open source art and it's doing two random segments. So it's an endless runner that will just keep cycling through and eventually I'll write a few. I'll write a few more segments so that it looks a little bit more like a game. But at this point, um, the game has kind of reached the status of being a little bit boring. Like I, I don't have that much to do anymore, uh, which is great uh, from like in many ways, development should be boring. Let's see if I can come back. Cool, I made it. Well, that's what I wanted, there we go. Um, so if any of you are still looking at the slides and you haven't all started playing Walk the Dog and made fun of my collision detection where you crash into nothing. Um, I'll just take you through a few of the steps. So 
uh, some I mentioned, there's no game engine here. Uh, the game engine in this one is just using request animation frame. So if you've ever used that in the browser, that's all it's using. And I wrote a little interface. So I, I don't want to bog everything down with a ton of code. The code is all open source. I should post a link in the chat when I get a chance. But the engine mimics a little bit of what XNA used to do. So you have a game object that implements this trait. Traits are a lot like interfaces in other languages. Initialize at the startup, update, and draw. And it has a structure for the game loop that just makes sure that the, the frames synchronize up right. It's, it's very uncomplicated. <laughs> it's uncomplicated enough that I could write it. It does not have, say, an entity component system or any of the other stuff you might feel is necessary to make a game. Rendering is also super easy. Uh, we're drawing images directly to the canvas. So any 3D or 2D GPU acceleration you're getting is because the browser decided to do it. Uh, I'm not writing any. This all just uses the canvas library. Uh, part of the inspiration of this book uh, was a joke I made in our Rust chat at 8th Light. Uh, I think I was telling it to Josh McCormick. He can tell me if I was right, where I said I was going to take, brought it up just for this, this book and port it to Rust, uh, which is this old, I don't know, 10 year old HTML5 canvas book I have. I didn't end up porting it, um, but I did use it as a reference because canvas is still there. So this is just using bitmaps and the canvas and uh, doing reasonably good enough drawing. It's still usually 60 frames a second. I have a frame rate counter. Um, nope, that's not what I wanted to do, sorry. You might be wondering why this function name is just so bloody long. And that is one of the things you get with uh, using Rust and uh, WebSys. So JavaScript supports overloading a function based on the number of parameters and does so all the time, right? Like there's like 12 different versions of draw image. Rust doesn't support that. And so what they've done is generated functions with very clear, here's what the parameters are. Uh, the documentation is pretty good. It's not too hard to look up. Uh, and usually it's like, it's at least the kind where you see and go, oh, okay, I get it. Uh, so state management. I swear half of my book is about how to write state machines in Rust. And there's going to be, I think, some rewriting in the next week or two. Um, state management is done mostly with enums and the from trait. So enums, I can, I'll start with first, but these are the abstract data, data types I was raving about before. Each one of these can, each Red Hat Boy state machine can be idle, running, sliding, jumping, falling, or knocked out. I felt bad calling it that. Um, each of those takes a struct, which is uh, itself of a type so that they can have different data in each one of these different states. To transition, for instance, from idle to running, that's what this one is, you actually write what is called the from trait. Uh, the, Rust has built into it traits for from and into, which are how you convert from one type to another. And when you use the from, when you implement the from, the into trait gets implemented automatically. So in order to go from idle to running, you just have that state you call into, and it will be able to transition right to running. And I've got a little function here for stuff that happens on this one where it resets the frame. So you start the animation at the beginning and you start running to the right and you return a new state in running. Uh, that matters because it's impossible without making significant effort, I guess, without really trying uh, to go from the wrong state to, from the right state to the wrong state. I can't get from idle to sliding. Those don't exist. And if I try, I get a compile error, not a runtime error. I get told before I hit build. Uh, just a few other things, from, not to asynchronous stuff um, is done using async await, which are in Rust. They're not quite as transparent as they are in um, async and await are not quite as easy to use, I'd argue, in, as they are in TypeScript, but they're very similar. The syntax is borrowed from them. Uh, this all uses the browser runtime, so we're able to just make it work. But what we have to do is take, say, fetch with stir here returns a JavaScript promise. 
Just use a simple web sys function to turn it into a Rust future and we get our await syntax. And see here, we then we take the error and we map it to one that we have common. Uh, events, like those come in via, the one thing I wanted to highlight on the events, it will actually, I wanted to highlight two things. One, you can see we have an enum again. I only do key ups and key downs. I don't got clicks and any of that stuff yet. Um, and when I go through each event, I'm able to check a few states. Now, how does this receiver work? The key event receiver try next is a channel. If you've used Go, you're probably familiar with channels. Uh, channels are just a way of doing asynchronous communication. So what happens is elsewhere, the key state puts this on a channel. And then this loop, and it actually happens every single game tick, loops through every one of those messages and checks. First off, was it okay? Um, second, was there an actual event? Because try next will return okay if there's no events. It's just saying, yeah, you did good. It's an empty list. So if we get an okay event ultimately with an event on it, and if it's a key up, we update this little state. And so I got this little mutable key state that just gets updated with the current state of buttons. Finally, music, maybe that's not finally. <laughs> Shouldn't say finally when you're not at the last one. Yeah. Music is just using web audio. Like this is all just native JavaScript stuff. And I really just wanted to show you some examples of interacting with the browser from a WebAssembly application. There's nothing here that is special. And is this the real finally? Uh, we're using for error handling. You're seeing this anyhow a lot, anyhow exclamation point. That means it's a macro in Rust. So anyhow, uh, actually lets me chain together and let you, and virtually every Rust programmer eventually starts using this. I suspect it'll, something like it will wander into the standard library at some point. But when you use uh, the JavaScript functions, you get back an error that is of the type JS value. You really want to convert it into an error that implements the error trait. So you can mush them together with other errors. Basically, if you have an error from one part of the system and you also have an error from another part of the system, you want to be able to check if it's either of them. So they have to implement the error trait. And so anyhow, lets you normalize all the errors in such a way that you can actually use them. So I wanted to highlight this. Nope. Highlight. Ah, you butthead. Highlight this example where, just to get the context, uh, if we were using JavaScript, right, we'd say canvas.context. And if it wasn't there and it blew up, we'd go, oh, well. In this case, we get the context and we map it to an error message that's useful. And this little question mark means exit because this returns a result. It's not there. We continue if there was a successful result. And we have to make sure because the context actually returns a result of an option. We have to make sure that it's not none. If it's none, we have a different error. Oh, we try to get it. There's no 2D context. Then we convert the JS value into this uh, context rendering 2D struct. And if that fails, we fail for a different reason. So all these things, the third one, maybe not. But these first two could all fail in JavaScript and just blow up as panic undefined. Um, and so this is why I like actually having the explicit error handling, even though sometimes it is pretty verbose. Now, how is the code structured? I think this is actually another pro of using a true language for building applications. We've been bolting the ability to develop applications onto JavaScript for 20 years now, maybe. You know, but this was really a language that was meant to like make your cursor wiggle while you were moving it around. It was originally implemented in a week. Um, and so only recently are we able to like sometimes put things in right orders. So here the structure is fairly straightforward. We've got one, two, three, four, five modules, browser, engine, game, segments, and sound. And the lib is just the entry point. I've reproduced the whole entry point right here. Uh, oh, down to the typo I showed you in the <laughs> I showed you in the uh, other screen. It is very easy to structure the code because it is easy to structure code in Rust programs.
or easier. Maybe nothing's easy. Shouldn't use that phrase, right? Um, and maybe we ah, we wrap all the calls to directly to that go directly to the browser. Um, I just feel like this is something we're pointing out that it's easier to work with the browser if you wrap everything in a module. That's why there's a browser module here. So you can take all this error handling and converting to types and bury it under the hood. And so for the rest of the program, I'm just going to go Canvas. Um, finally, this is the part I want to say is most important is this is all in what I'm calling simple Rust. So if you're familiar with Rust, you may have heard of unsafe. Unsafe gets you out of all those guarantees I raved about in the beginning. There's no unsafe code in the project. I didn't have to use it. And you may have heard of lifetimes, which I did not mention throughout the presentation because they're complicated, confusing, and I only use one of them. And that's this dot static here. Uh, and when I asked my the Rust programmer friends, what do you do with lifetimes? They're like, usually I just bang at them and then I finally give up and put static. Um, static just means the game will last for the entire the game object will last for the entire program. So if those are things that you've heard of before and they intimidate you, they're not something that's worth worrying about. You can still write, write Rust code. You'll be fine. A Rustation is anybody who writes Rust, not somebody who's you know able to write a compiler from scratch in a closet with no internet. We did all that and we got to a working game. You know, Yes, there is uh, bugs in my collision detection. That's not caused by Rust. That's caused by this guy. We've got graphics, we've got music. Uh, there's a sound effect, just the one. Probably should add a couple more, right? And it's deployed on the web. We got all the way there using tools that are not native to the web originally, but tools that I like a lot better than the ones that are native to the web originally. Uh, so are we game yet that RS is a Rust website that asks the question, is Rust game yet? And I know I already said this at the beginning, but the answer to me is yes. They say, no, it's not ready. You have to bring your own glue. But you know, my favorite all-time game is Civilization. And Civilization 1 did not need Unity, right? Did not need all that other stuff. They built it. And in fact, even to this day, a lot of your you know, super AAA studios are building their own tools. You know, Space Invaders was written all in assembler by the definition that are we a game yet folks have put up and this is actually a really nice community site like they link all to the game stuff they will give you resources that are helpful so i don't want to tease them too much but um if we said no we're not game yet because we don't have unity 3d and ogre and uh unreal then we'll never be game yet because if we had said that 15 years ago there'd be no video games Rust will not be a triple A first class game programming language until we write games in it. And I think it's ready for that. It's ready for those games. So what is next? Uh, this is kind of like, what's next for you? What's next for me? Uh, first of all, you know, you should all buy a great Christmas gift. Um, so there's the, there's the link to the book. I didn't, I didn't have a handy link. Uh, it's a, think of it as buying a Christmas gift for yourself and for me. Um, but basically this book is 316 pages, I counted this morning, of you following along with me while I write that game. It's available for you know, pre-order now, it's supposedly gonna be out in March. We'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm not great with schedules. But that's a great way to learn more about this. Um, my stream will be coming back soon. <laughs> hey, look, someone's name is right there on the bottom. Uh, any minute now. And I've got a few different ideas going forward. You know, if you're interested, uh, I will, I've thought about maybe binding to pixie.js, which is a JavaScript framework uh, that you could write in Rust. I've thought about using MacroQuad, which is a small library. And I've thought about using Bevy. Uh, for the next one. Or I might go back to using more Godot. I'm really not 100% positive. Or I might just extend my current engine. Point is, we'll be doing more Rust, more JavaScript, and more game dev because it's fun. Uh, and I enjoy it when uh, 
the game develop when you when you all show up at the game dev when when i can't get any work done because i'm answering questions that's when streaming is the most fun and you know what's the next game going to be is i don't 100 percent know yet i got a few that are sort of on the table we need to wrap up the last bits of walk the dog including showing the dog um but i got you know a few that are on the list might do another port of space invaders haven't done that in rust yet <clears throat> I have um, a old game treatment that I did in school called Tech Support Zombies, where there are a bunch of developers in cubicles. Can you tell what I do for a living? A bunch of developers in cubicles who have had their coffee spiked to make them more productive. When their computer breaks, they go insane. Well, you are the IT person whose job it is to fix the computers. And my thinking is it might be a really good way to start learning Unix commands. You run up to the computer, you need to untar a file without looking on the internet. Uh, so something like that, there'll be some fun. 